Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I know the rain has dampened our attendance a little, but we're delighted that, uh, that you all were able to make it out this evening. The Foreign Policy Initiative is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that was started just under one year ago. Um, we are dedicated to meeting the foreign policy and national security challenges and opportunities of the 21st century um, while promoting U.S. international engagement um, that champions freedom, democracy, and human rights. Uh, my name is Rachel Hoff. I serve as Director of External Affairs for the Foreign Policy Initiative, and I've also been a member of Young Professionals in Foreign Policy since 2004. At that time, I was a research assistant at the American Enterprise Institute, and since then have always looked to YPFP as a source of, of insight and discussion and debate um, with some of the leading foreign policy thinkers in town. To that end, I'm very excited to welcome you to this evening's event, co-hosted by the Young Professionals in Foreign Policy and the Foreign Policy Initiative um, with Dr. Robert Kagan. Uh, to introduce him, I'd like to inter introduce you all to Jasmine Elgamal, who's the co-chair of YPFP's Middle East Discussion Group. Thanks, Jasmine. Thank you all very much for coming and for braving the rain. I think a lot of people are stuck uh, and are going to be making their way over, uh, hopefully soon. Um, as Rachel said, we are really, really pleased to have Dr. Kagan uh, address us tonight. Dr. Kagan uh, needs no introduction, but I'll just tell you a little bit about him. He's a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. His most recent book is The Return of History and the End of Dreams. His previous book, Dangerous Nation, America's Place in the World from its Earliest Days to the Dawn of the 20th Century, was the winner of the 2008 Leb Gold Prize and a 2007 finalist for the Lionel Gelber Prize. Dr. Kagan writes a monthly column on world affairs for the Washington Post as, and is a contributing editor at both the Weekly Standard and the New Republic. I know that many of you are no strangers to his work. He is listed as one of the world's top 100 public intellectuals by Foreign Policy and Prospect magazines and served at the State Department from 1984 to 1988 as a member of the policy planning staff, as principal speechwriter for Secretary of State George Shultz, and as deputy for policy in the Bureau of Inter-American Affairs. His uh, educational background is no less impressive. He's a graduate of Yale University and Harvard University's Kennedy School of government and holds a PhD in American history from American University. Please welcome Dr. Robert Kagan. Thank you, Jasmine. Well, I don't know if I would walk through the rain to see me speak, so I don't know what that says about you. But in any case, I really appreciate your being here. I, um, I think that your organization uh, is very important and very welcome, uh, especially at a time when I guess foreign policy is. Uh, looming larger and larger, even in the middle of our domestic travails, we know that the world is not going to leave us alone, uh, nor should we leave it alone. Uh, we've seen the price of that. It's, uh, I want to say I, I approached the idea of talking about the Obama administration's foreign policy cautiously. Uh, in fact, I've, I've not really done so before this, at least publicly, because uh, no administration can really be judged on its foreign policy after one year. Um, if you look at recent administrations, the, the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, I think the world turned out to be different than they expected. A lot of uh, things that they brought uh, to uh, when they came in, a lot of things that they believed that they were going to do, they didn't wind up doing. Um, uh, the world has a way of sucking America into it, partly because America has made itself such an integral part of international affairs. Uh, that whatever you come in thinking, uh, sometimes it's contact with reality uh, forces a shift. And I believe, actually, that this administration now is in the midst of a certain uh, shift uh, and flux, and that it's actually hard to predict where it will be, say, a year from now. Uh, I would say, to characterize this administration's foreign policy coming in, uh, it was not Bush. Uh, and that was pretty much up and down the line. If Bush favored democracy, we're not favoring democracy. If Bush had a bad relationship with Russia, we're going to have a good relationship with Russia. Uh, if Bush was fighting the war on terror, we're not going to call it the war on terror, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that really, you know, doesn't sustain you very far uh, as you try to begin to uh, make policy and deal with some of these other countries. And I think that uh, one of the uh, certain consequences of this first year in office is that the administration is now having to move beyond not Bush, 
uh, and formulate some policies uh, based on the reality that they're dealing with. So, as I say, I, hesi- I, I, I would caution, I caution myself and I caution you to drawing any major conclusions. Uh, continuity is, in the American foreign policy, it generally greater than discontinuity. Um, presidents are not as different from one another as they think they're going to be, and sometimes as, as, as they certainly not the way they sound in campaigns, uh, but not even, I think, the way, in the ways that we expect them to be. I think historians will find much more continuity between Clinton uh, and George W. Bush in terms of foreign policies, including, if I may say so, on the subject of Iraq, uh, than we seem to be aware of. And I dare say we will find more continuity, and I know this is a horrific thing to say, uh, between George W. Bush's foreign policies and some, and, and also in terms of dealing with terror, and some of Barack Obama's policies. Um, there's good reasons for this. American interests don't change overnight. The world itself doesn't change overnight. And the requirements of an American president uh, are fairly constant uh, in terms of responding to a domestic public opinion, which, by the way, that public opinion is rooted in ideas about what America is that go back two centuries. Um, You know, we don't change that much as a people, and therefore what a president has to respond to politically uh, doesn't change that much either. So we're likely to see... Uh, a lot of continuity. And in the hope of upsetting all of you in one way or another, I'm going to suggest areas of continuity and discontinuity that may may surprise you. Um, In terms of fighting the war on terror, for instance, I would predict that you're going to see uh, an Obama administration that is not uh, dramatically different from the Bush administration. Already, we've seen that uh, promises to close Guantanamo uh, in a year have gone by the wayside. I would say it's not going to be closed in two years. It may not be closed in three years. Uh, and who knows when it's going to be closed? And that's because the administration has had to deal with the difficulty of figuring out what to do with these people. I notice that since uh, the fortunately failed Christmas bombing attack, the Obama administration put 10 nations on a watch list. I think they happen to be nations of predominantly Muslim populations. That's not probably what you expected from Barack Obama. In terms of the use of force in the, in the activity formerly known as the War on Terror, uh, there are ways in which the Obama administration has increased the use of force. Um, They have increased by 30,000 the number of troops fighting in Afghanistan. I think if the Bush administration had a third term, they might have done the same thing. If John McCain had gotten elected, he might have done the same thing. But certainly uh, they haven't shied away from military action as a key tool in fighting terrorism by by Barack Obama's own uh, account of what he's done. Uh, They've significantly increased drone attacks on, uh, on suspected terrorists and Taliban Uh, sites in Pakistan. In fact, if I have the numbers right, there have been more drone attacks uh, uh, against suspected terrorists and Taliban in the last year than there were in the previous five years of the Bush administration. Um, There's a lot of talk about what uh, the the Obama administration wants to do with suspected or captured terrorists once they get here, and it may be ironic that while the Obama administration wants to give them more rights once they've been caught, it also seems to be taking greater effort to assassinate them before we have to worry about the whole trial aspect of it. So, uh, and if you look at at a much larger question in terms of military power, um, I happen to think that there isn't enough money spent on the defense budget in the United States. I thought that under Clinton. I thought that under the first Bush administration. I thought that under the second Bush administration, as Paul Wolfowitz can attest, uh, but, but nevertheless, um, this administration uh, is continuing a very high, uh, at least relatively speaking, level of defense spending. Again, it's not enough, but there's talk of spending, if you include the two wars, upwards of $700 billion a year on defense. You are not seeing uh, from this administration a desire to make deep cuts uh, in defense, despite, although I'm sure there may be cuts here and there. And, and interestingly, you're not even seeing a strong domestic demand Uh, for cuts in defense spending, entirely different from what the case was in the 1980s when cutting the defense budget was a major plank of the Democratic Party. It's not a major plank of the Democratic Party now. Barack Obama didn't run on it, uh, and there's no sign that he plans to execute it, uh, even though I think he will probably wind up doing too little, 
given our global commitments. So, you know, on, on some of these measures, uh, it'll be interesting to see whether historians will record a dramatic shift or some uh, degree of continuity with 10 degrees in one direction and 10 degrees in another uh, from, uh, uh, from Bush to Obama. And there's a very good reason for this. And I think looking forward, any anticipation that Barack Obama will allow himself for the purposes of the midterm elections, much less for the purpose of 2012 re-election campaign, to be portrayed as soft on terror uh, by his uh, political opponents, I think he is unlikely to allow himself to be put in that position. There is nothing that is more damaging to an American president in the present era than allowing a terrorist attack to occur on the soil of the United States again. Um, and I think we've already seen, uh, despite a lot of rhetoric about how much they want to change the approach, I predict that, the, that there's not, again, because the president's mind is very concentrated on the subject of not allowing a terrorist attack on his watch, uh, that we will not, that the rhetoric will be overtaken by the almost the, the political imperative of seeing to it that this doesn't happen. So I would predict uh, at least more hawkishness than people expected, uh, and perhaps more hawkishness even than we're seeing now as the years go by. I make that prediction with some humility. We don't know what's going to happen, but I do think that's a reasonable expectation. Now, having spent the first uh, part of my comments talking about con uh, continuity, I'd like to discuss an area of potential discontinuity, uh, which I think um, may have very broad ramifications if the Obama administration uh, is able, finds itself able to continue moving in the direction that it has begun on. And uh, I've fleshed this argument out at, at greater length in an article in World Affairs recently than I probably will tonight, but uh, what I have seen, both in terms of speeches, particularly by Hillary Clinton, but also by President Obama, and in terms of actions, uh, is what, I'm, what I think I see as the beginning of a shift away from a grand strategy toward the world that has basically been the predominant grand strategy of the United States since World War II. Uh, and that for the first time, I think that grand strategy is being seriously rethought and an attempt is being made by this administration to move away from it. Now, uh, as I will also make clear in the course of elaborating this point, I think that there is uh, some degree uh, of inevitability in this reconsideration. Some of it is a response to forces that certainly predate the Obama administration. Uh, some elements of this approach to the world that I'm about to describe can be glimpsed in uh, the previous administration, um, but that in this case, uh, if, if the Obama administration is really is able to carry out uh, its approach, it really could lead uh, to a dramatic shift, something that I would describe as a dramatic shift from all previous administrations, including the last. Now, the strategy that I'm referring to is a strategy that was born after the Second World War, and it was basically a strategy of uh, extending and protecting uh, a liberal international uh, order within a larger uh, international framework that contained uh, opponents and challengers uh, to that order. Uh, if you look at the post-World War II order that was set up, it was based on a couple of uh, key uh, pillars. One uh, was uh, American uh, primacy uh, in the international system. The other was a, uh, a series of global political and strategic alliances, chiefly almost entirely with other democratic nations, but certainly uh, what we all came to regard, or at least what people called in those days, the free world. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, in addition to that, an economic order, a liberal capitalist economic order uh, that was going to undergird that. And the basic premise of that strategy was to protect this democratic order uh, within its confines uh, until such time as its challengers, and in those days that challenger was pre pre pretty much the Soviet Union, but it also uh, came to include communist China, until such time as the challengers um, either uh, collapsed or altered themselves in such a way as to make it possible to include them in this democratic 
uh, international system that the United States had made itself uh, the central uh, pillar of. Uh, if you look at the even the, uh, the famous long telegram of George Kennan, <clears throat> his argument was to contain the Soviet Union until such time as the Soviet Union underwent, uh, and, uh, having found itself contained, uh, underwent internal change, mellowed, uh, whatever, whatever term you're looking for, and made itself a safer partner in the international system. If you look at the early pol- at the policies of Dean Acheson, he was not interested in negotiating with the Soviet Union at a time when the West had failed to demonstrate yet its overwhelming strength uh, and wanted to await a time when that would happen. And you can look at American strategy from uh, Acheson and Truman through Ronald Reagan uh, as being a coherent whole because at the end of the day, um, the United States and its allies made themselves strong enough uh, that the Soviet Union ultimately did uh, decide that it could not continue in this way uh, and effectively sued for a settlement of the Cold War conflict on terms that were essentially favorable uh, to what we used to call uh, the West. Uh, But this strategy uh, that I'm describing did not end with Ronald Reagan and did not end uh, with the Cold War and, in fact, was continued right up through, uh, certainly uh, in its most uh, vigorous form, uh, the Clinton administration. Because the Clinton administration's overarching policy, which was once described, even though they abandoned the term later, as democratic enlargement, was about enlarging even further the sphere of the democratic international order and encouraging, and in those days it seemed to be an optimist, they seemed to be hope that the encouragement would work, encouraging significant democratic transitions both in Russia, where in the 1990s it did seem to be moving forward, and in China, where the reigning idea was that the, the, over, the gradual liberalization of the Chinese economy would inevitably lead to the liberalization of the Chinese uh, political order, so that uh, at the end of the day, you had uh, not a shift from the original strategy, but the expansion, and I would suppose you might say the ultimate culmination of the goals of that strategy, which was an overwhelmingly democratic <laughs> world and the expansion uh, of a democratic international order to include almost everyone. Uh, but certainly to include the great powers. Uh, So the last Democratic president uh, spoke of the United States as the indispensable nation, spoke about the imperative of democratic enlargement, and spoke about and acted on uh, the, in aiding the transformation of Russia toward democracy, and spoke about the need to use trade, I don't, setting aside the virtues or likely success of this policy, but nevertheless spoke about the the use of trade to transform China from within. Now, this was also, I think, very clearly the overall approach of the last Bush administration, uh, but something came along which created a bit of a distraction, and that something was September 11th. Uh, And I think September 11th, I think it's only fair to say, Uh, at least uh, began to raise some uh, questions about whether we were going to continue along this grand strategy because in the desire uh, to find allies in September 11th, uh, the Bush administration did look to Russia and China uh, as and, and to look at those countries to some extent through the prism of September 11th and to look at Russia as a potential ally in the war on terror and to look at China as a potential ally in the war on terror. But at the same time, the Bush administration also continued the old project uh, by forging a tighter, a closer strategic relationship with India, by attempting to improve relations with uh, Japan. The crisis in Europe, despite what everyone thinks, was not the Bush administration's desire, certainly, to harm our relations with uh, Europe. On the contrary, uh, the Bush administration pursued NATO enlargement, took Europe very seriously, and was surprised, as I think even many Europeans were surprised, that Iraq caused such a schism. It certainly wasn't the goal to abandon the alliance, even if the result of events was that the alliance was damaged. And then we get to uh, the present administration. If you look, again, at the speeches, the early speeches, uh, and again, I I particularly focus on a speech that uh, Secretary Clinton gave in the Council on Foreign Relations, I think it was in June, sometime this summer, 
uh, in which it's sort of the first effort at a kind of big think approach to what American foreign policy should be. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of talk about the United States not as uh, setting aside the question of primacy, but not as the organizer of an international democratic order, uh, but the United States as a kind of convener of all the nations. Uh, it's, it's, it's what I call the G20 vision. It's the G20 world, uh, which is not looking at the world uh, as democratic or not democratic, but is looking at uh, who has the power, who has economic ability. Um, the, the mission that, that Clinton describes is as the convener of nations. Uh, at the same time, we also see, in terms of practical policy, uh, new emphasis put on so-called resetting the relationship with Russia, uh, continuing, uh, but perhaps even going farther, further than the Bush administration's and previous Clinton administration's effort to engage China. We now have talk of um, uh, strategic reassurance uh, with China, which is, uh, I think, if it, if it makes any sense at all, uh, is about somehow making it, easy, it sort of taking the pressure off of China, uh, sort of making it clear that we welcome its rise rather than wanting to constrain its rise in any way. Um, and what we see is uh, a, a policy designed to improve relations with Russia and China. And the question is, can you improve relations with Russia and China uh, without uh, causing difficulties for the traditional and uh, for the 60 years' worth of alliances uh, who fear in their own neighborhoods the rise of Russia and China. And the position that I think the uh, Obama administration has set out for itself uh, almost consciously is one of greater neutrality uh, in these conflicts because as the convener of nations, uh, you can't really choose sides. Uh, you, uh, and there's a tremendous emphasis uh, in, the, in, the, in the rhetoric, and I think even in the belief, on the common interests of all nations, and particularly of the common interests of the great powers, the common interests we share with Russia, the common interests we share with China. Uh, President Obama is very clear in rejecting what he calls zero-sum calculations in dealing with these countries and endorsing uh, what might be called win-win uh, scenarios uh, with all of these countries. Uh, but if you think about it almost as a mathematical reality, uh, if you are getting closer to a previous uh, challenger or adversary, uh, then you are necessarily moving a little bit away uh, from the allies that you used to support uh, in dealing with that with that uh, former adversary or potential, uh, potential challenger. And again, this is not just a theoretical matter, but we've actually seen it occurring in concrete ways uh, all around the world, this new neutrality, um, where, for instance, uh, Russia's objection to a missile defense deployments in Poland, and I want to completely set aside what everyone thinks about the proper missile defense architecture that we should or should not have in Europe, uh, nevertheless, the political consequence and the geopolitical consequence of this administration's decision was to throw real doubt uh, among, uh, on the part of Eastern Europeans about the American commitment to their security. Because unfortunately, despite what, uh, what people might want to hope was true, uh, when you're talking about Poland and the Baltics, uh, Georgia, Ukraine, and Russia, this isn't all win-win. Uh, there are zero-sum realities out there. You can't uh, shift over uh, to the Russian side of the equation without raising concerns, and I would even say legitimate concerns, on the part of Russia's neighbors who are worried about a, re a resurgence of Russian nationalism and, a, and, a, and even Russian uh, neo-imperialism. And the same is true in Asia. Uh, you can't... Uh, position yourself, uh, as some in India fear the United States has, as a kind of neutral arbiter between China and India without raising questions about the strategic commitment of the United States in its relationship with India vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, which is really all India cares about. Um, if you can put yourself in the middle 
between Israel and, pa- and the Palestinians or Israel and the Arab world. And by the way, they, this isn't the first administration to try to take that position. Nevertheless, the, the net result is that a longtime ally uh, has a less of a feeling of commitment and security, and, and those who have taken a much darker view of the United States uh, are, are benefiting in that, in that scenario. Um, and even in Latin America, if you are reaching out to Hugo Chavez, uh, you cannot help but have an effect on the relationships that you're having with longtime allies like Colombia's government uh, and others. So uh, it's this repositioning of the United States uh, as a kind of neutral uh, uh, arbiter uh, of, inter- of the international conflicts that exist, which I think really, if it, if it continues, really does represent a very dramatic shift uh, in the approach that the United States has historically taken. Uh, I mean, there are examples where we have, <clears throat> there are exa- past examples of, of efforts to do this. When Henry Kissinger was pursuing detente Uh, with the Soviet Union, it came at the expense of Western Europe to the point where the Western Europeans indeed became very nervous about it, uh, and Kissinger had to do a fair amount of repair work. So it's not unprecedented, uh, but the Kissinger experiment really didn't last very long, if you think about it, Um, uh, and and we went back to, uh, even under Carter, and certainly under Reagan, uh, the old model. Now, again, I, I said before, it's not surprising that this temptation exists, because the prevailing view that, uh, if you look at sort of conventional foreign policy establishment wisdom, when Obama took office, uh, there are elements of it which might lead anyone to think that maybe this is the right way to go. First of all, and very importantly, the idea of America in decline. And I think that there is a large degree to which the Obama administration has accepted the idea of inevitable American decline and has followed the prescription of trying to find some modus vivendi with what they perceive, what people perceive as the two great rising powers, although I don't know if people really think Russia is a rising power, but it's certainly rising in terms of where it was, uh, so so that you have to accommodate those interests as part of the reality of decline. Uh, in the hope that if you make this accommodation now that somehow uh, it won't be such a, uh, a lurching uh, change later, but the reality is one of accommodation and acceptance uh, of decline. And, of course, the other is, this is again, the view that the future lies, you know, with China. Uh, the future does not lie, for instance, in Europe. The future does not lie with Japan. In other words, the future does not lie with America's traditional allies, Uh, but lies somewhere else. So you might just say, uh, well, the Obama administration is, and I'm sure the Obama administration would say, uh, that they're simply adjusting to uh, reality. Uh, Well, quite honestly, I'm not sure that this reality uh, is so inevitable. I am not a believer that America is in decline. I think that's yet, we're in yet another fashionable phase that we seem to go through uh, pretty much every 10 years when the economy uh, becomes sour for a while that this is finally it and and it's all over. I'm not at all persuaded that that's true. I think the American economy will will bounce back eventually if we don't do irreparable damage to it uh, with uh, various government policies. I have a lot of faith in the innovative uh, nature and the flexible nature of the American economy and much less faith that the that the Chinese system can move ahead just interminably without making any major political reforms, but certainly, uh, or that it can even pursue this model forever. And if you had to ask me which economy I would bet on over 20 years, I would still bet on the American economy. But what I do fear is that decline can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And if you act like you're in decline, uh, you can, in fact, hasten uh, and, and even create decline. And if the result of your policies is that you are drawing Uh, somewhat away from your traditional allies, thereby weakening them uh, in dealing with the rising would-be hegemons of their region, well, then you really will be creating uh, a situation uh, of decline. Uh, And that's what what I find very worrying now. Uh, If you go to Europe or talk to Europeans today, uh, despite their great joy at seeing the the rear end of the Bush administration in in the mirror, Uh, they are nevertheless very nervous now that the Obama administration has lost interest in Europe altogether. Uh, In Eastern Europe, it's beyond that. In Eastern Europe, they really feel that the United States uh, is leaving Eastern Europe out 
uh, to the tender mercies of their neighbors, and the United States is not really making a strategic commitment to Eastern Europe. But even in Western Europe, uh, I am constantly asked uh, by Brits, by French, by Germans, does the United States care about us anymore? Um, and I think that that's something that the Obama administration needs to address, but I think the reality is that as the Obama administration looks out at the rest of the world and looks out at who it thinks it wants to spend its time doing business with, it is much more looking at China, it is much more looking at Russia, and it is much less looking at Japan, and it is much less looking uh, at Europe. Um, and as I say, if that is true and if they're able to continue along this course, uh, that really will be a very substantial shift and, in my view, a very deleterious shift. Now, uh, because I'm uh, somewhat of a historical determinist, I'm not sure the Obama administration can actually continue to pursue such a policy. I think Russia is a very difficult partner and will be a very difficult partner. And at the end of the day, the Obama administration is bound to be frustrated uh, by Russia. I think that, uh, similarly, uh, the notion that China uh, is not going to be an increasing uh, problem for the United States as it gets richer, stronger, spends more money on its military, uh, begins to throw its weight around, however subtly it does so. And by the way, uh, China doesn't have to be in any way abnormal or even particularly evil uh, to pursue this course. They only have to be normal. Uh, n countries that gain greater wealth uh, generally seek greater power and a greater say in how the international system uh, is organized. We certainly did as a nation at the end of the 19th century, and I think that's where China is today. The problem is, is that uh, if every gain of China's in that region is a loss of American position and is ultimately uh, a weakening of the uh, strategic ties that the United States has with countries in that region, and so that is a zero-sum situation. Um, I, I would be in favor of, uh, so therefore I think that this may be, it may be difficult for this administration to pull off this shift in strategy, and I guess the only thing I worry about is the damage that can be done uh, as they attempt to before they are forced to make a correction if they make a correction. I'll stop there. Again, I, I say I, uh, I can only speculate as to where these things are going, and a few speeches and even a few policies don't uh, make a foreign policy, and we'll see what happens over the coming years, but that's how it looks to me right now. And I'd be delighted to take questions or comments or whatever you folks want to throw at me. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone that when you ask your questions, that you keep them brief. I know we don't have Dr. Kagan for too much longer. So state your name and affiliation, and then uh, ask a brief question. Remember that the Q&A session is off the record. The statement that Dr. Kagan just made was on the record. Um, I will take advantage. I don't say anything off the record these days, but maybe you guys want it off the record. <laughs> um, if I may ask the first question, just because yeah. I was the moderator. Yeah, you get to. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, Jasmine Elgamal, OSD Policy, Department of Defense. Uh, I, I have about 20 questions that I want to ask, but I'll, I'll try to pick just one. I think you, you brought up a lot of just really compelling points about how the Obama administration should act in the coming year, let's say, I mean, based on what they've done in the past year, based on what they haven't been able to accomplish. Um, and you've talked about what you don't like, you know, in terms of what they've done and what they haven't done. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you would like to see the Obama administration do in the, in the coming six months or year, because, I mean, if you think about it, we have the withdrawal from Iraq, we have ramping up in Afghanistan, we have political domestic turmoil in Iran, we have a faltering peace process, we just, I mean, see, everywhere you look, there are just challenges that seem just as important as the next. Yeah. Where, where can we begin? Well, I think, and uh, I could now raise the issue, which I think is the most important issue, which I failed to talk about in the 45, 30, 30 minutes that I spoke, but, but I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to do so. I mean, the most important issue, I think the most important potentially significant development that we're facing right now uh, would be the collapse of the Iranian regime. I mean, we wouldn't even have talked about this a year ago, um, and, uh, you know, the fact that we can talk about it, I think, is, is, is extremely significant. If, if I had to say what event is more likely to have uh, a hugely positive impact 
uh, on the international system in general and on America and the interests in particular, I would say uh, the, uh, the popular uh, demand uh, and successful demand for uh, regime change in Iran. And uh, because in Iran uh, that uh, was more democratic and possibly, in fact, even genuinely democratic, uh, that, that was seeking genuinely to integrate itself uh, into the international liberal order, uh, would take a problem that has been uh, causing us enormous damage ever since uh, the late 19, since 1979 uh, and, and completely reverse that. So I think that is the most important thing uh, facing us right now. I think personally that the Obama administration has been far too slow uh, to realize, uh, they like the term game changer, this is the ultimate game changer. They've been slow to realize that this is a real possibility and that it really, it is more in our interest to see that regime change in Iran than it is to get uh, some uh, kind of nuclear uh, diplomatic agreement which, you know, of dubious reliability uh, that, that, that they may be going for. Now, as I said before, they may be moving in that direction in their own way and at their own speed anyway. Uh, it remains to be seen. And you'll ask me, what can we do? because that's, of course, a very, you know, complicated question. But I do think we should uh, use uh, sanctions now to put more pressure on the regime. I'm not one of those who thinks that if we sanction Iran more than we're sanctioning, if we get international sanctions that are tighter, that this will sometime, somehow lead to a, a rallying around the regime. I think those days are over. The Iranian public, uh, especially the people who have been out in the streets, are not going to rally around this regime. And I would like to see President Obama using his great bully pulpit uh, to encourage uh, the people of Iran to, to seek this kind of change. So that, that's what I would like to see. And I'm not prepared to guarantee that we're not going to see it. I think it's still a possibility, and it would have huge, huge impact. Yes? Hi, my name is Rebecca Davis. I'm at Georgetown University. Could you talk about your read on Obama's nonproliferation policies and with uh, the follow-on, start follow-on dragging on and getting close to the, the REFCON conference without having, potentially without having sort of a big announcement or a big um, win to go into that and then looking to the midterm elections? Do you think that they try to say too much, uh, or too much? Well, I mean, I, I don't think it's surprising that they attempted to, to get this. I think they were overly optimistic about how eager the Russians were to, to get a, an agreement. I think the Russians are having a just fabulous time uh, driving them crazy. Um, I think the Russians perceive that the Obama administration wants a deal very badly precisely to move on with this nonproliferation agenda, and the Russians couldn't care less about a nonproliferation agenda. Um, what the Russians want, as best as they possibly can, is to always be the finger that's twirling the world uh, around, and this is one of those issues. So I don't know how long it's going to take to resolve the 5% uh, uh, disagreement that the Russians claim still exists, but since one of those 5% disagreement is the whole issue of missile defense, if they're serious about that, uh, it, could be, it could be an interesting problem. So um, I think the premise of the administration's nonproliferation policy um, that if somehow you got an arms agreement with the, with the Russians that would then lead to a, you know, new progress on the nonproliferation uh, regime, that this would then have a spillover effect on Iranian attitudes or even on the attitudes of others putting pressure on Iran. I thought that was always a three-carom shot that I didn't really uh, believe in. I don't think the Chinese care one way or another uh, about the nonproliferation regime given their own behavior. Uh, and so to expect that you're going to influence them that way, um, I think, is unlikely. And, and the notion that if America says we want to abolish all nuclear weapons and somehow help us in Iran, I think that was fairly idealistic. So the, the arms control agenda is another one where expectations based on the mistaken belief that Bush didn't want to do anything um, couldn't do anything because he was Bush, and once we, the Obama administration, come in, we can solve all these problems. This is just another area where they're running into difficulties. Not to say that I don't expect them to have a start agreement at some point. It just is not going to be when they wanted to have a start agreement. Yes, in the back. Uh, Jamie Crowd, I work at CSIS. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about Missile Defense Review. I mean, I agree with your assessment that Europe is feeling rather unloved by the Obama administration. 
Um, and I think that, unfortunately, the Bush administration's missile defense program became a representation of our commitment to Europe and the transatlantic relationship. So Obama's decision to review that was seen as sort of reneging on our commitment. Um, but I disagree with you in that I think substantively it, has, it is a stronger policy. However, I think that the perception in that the rollout was extremely um, poorly timed and wasn't very well designed because of the timing and uh, yeah. um, created this perception yeah. of the Obama administration's lack of commitment to that region of the world. Could you elaborate a little in terms of the perception versus the actual substantive revision of the missile defense review? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure – I'll certainly say this about myself. I won't say this about you. I'm not equipped to tell you exactly which – you know, configuration of missile defense is the right configuration of missile defense. Uh, one thing I do know from the if you're a pole if you're in if you're in Poland, um, the 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 eventual uh, in, interceptors that they're supposed to get is are not are not scheduled to arrive uh, now before 2000. I think it's 18, which from and I've talked to polls about this, which is so safely beyond Obama's second term that you might as well be promising to deploy them in, in the year 4,000, as far as the polls are concerned. I mean, the sense that the United States just really didn't want to go ahead with this, even if the eventual configuration is lovely, um, it's more than just a perceptual problem when you say we're delaying this now so far in the future that nobody even knows what, whether it's ever going to happen. That's the Polish view. And on the bungling of the rollout. And I think everybody agrees that the rollout was bungled. And the polls know that the rollout was bungled, too. But what they would say, and I'm not sure they're wrong, is that it was bungled because they didn't care that much. I mean, if you really cared about not worrying Eastern Europe, you wouldn't bungle it. Now, that anybody who's been in government knows that that's not necessarily true. Because <laughs> bungling is kind of what governments do for a living. But in this case, I think it is true that too little consideration was given uh, and the reason is, I'm sorry, you know, most administrations, amazingly enough, with all the hundreds of people making policy, cannot walk and chew gum at the same time. And the administration is heavily focused on reset with Russia. And other things are just taking a lower priority. And one of the things that's taking lower priority is reassurance to Central and Eastern Europe. And guess what? The Central and Eastern Europeans know it. And that's, you know, it's unfortunate uh, that, that it, you know, that they bungled it. But as I say, there's something in the bungling that is revealing, too. Yes, ma'am. I would just like to point out that it's not um, fault of the Obama administration entirely, the missile defense issue. As far as I hate to say that, the Polish were known for, were known for their excessive demands in return. Uh, in the Czech Republic, there was a political political crisis, and the support for the third side was around 40%. So can you please elaborate more on that? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's no there's no question that, that, that things – quite honestly, from all points of view, if the Bush administration could have poured concrete while it was still in office, uh, that would have been the best solution. And it didn't happen for a number of reasons, and one of those reasons was the polls driving a hard bargain. Uh, there's, there's, that there's some, there's some truth to that. Um, the Czech Republic, I knew, I mean, I knew this would happen. The, they, they said they didn't really care about this and they don't really want it until we said that we're not going to do it. And now they're having a nervous breakdown because you've abandoned us. I mean, this is people are people, uh, and that's the way that that's all true. And, and you know, you can you can work through the details of any one of these sort of situations and say, well, this is this happened because of this and this. Fair enough. Um, However, there's no escaping the message that has been sent and the message that has not been adequately corrected, in my view, yet, um, although it may be corrected in the future. Yes? Um, you talked a little bit about the shift in uh, the attitude around a liberal international system. Um, and in the aftermath of September 11th and the subsequent and recent attention on the rise of non-state actors, I wonder if, if you can talk in the shift a little bit about how you see the arc of the nation state itself um, from World War II to the present and how much the role of the role of the U.S. as a sort of neutral arbiter between common, commonly interested states is about the defense of, of the nation state itself 
versus sort of competing organizing principles or views yeah. of organizing principles? Yeah, that's a good question, and I'm not one of I, I'm not one of the believers that the that the nation state is on its way out. In fact, I would say the evidence suggests that the nation state is actually on its way back. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the things that were supposed to uh, pull the nation state down, uh, globalization, uh, has actually lead, led in many cases to the state reasserting itself with the support of the people as a means of defending themselves against globalization. The internet was supposed to be a solvent uh, uh, of, of the nation state and to sort of, you know, make it so porous that it would cease to have influence. The, what, what we're watching and China was supposed to be the perfect example of this. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Tom Friedman said the Internet was going to, you know, pull down the Chinese government. But it does seem that governments have a very uh, stronger capacity to deal with this than we thought. Now, you know, the, the non-state actors uh, are, are strong. I think we've always underestimated – they were strong in the past, too. It's not as if they didn't exist even in, at the beginning of the 20th century, for that matter. Uh, but we've tremendously overstated – their influence, and I think underestimated. And if you look at Russia and China, you see the resurgence of the nation state in a very, in a very strong way. So I, I, I wouldn't base any policy uh, on the anticipated withering of the nation state at this point. Yes. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Scott. I'm with NPRA. Um, and I, I was wondering if you could talk for a little bit about kind of how foreign policy, at least in the Obama administration, even towards the end of the Bush administration, really has encompassed a lot of things that it didn't before in terms of development, climate change issues. Um, we had Secretary Clinton last week declaring that cybersecurity is now an important aspect of our, of our foreign policy. So, I mean, are, how would you place that in context of – the Obama doctrine, such as it is, and and also just in terms of your historical background. I'm, I'm sorry, was the beginning of the, the point that, that they are introducing new things? Not new things, but it's, I mean, these are not new ideas, yeah. but just in order that it's a different focus. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I would say making development an issue is not a new focus. It's not a different focus. It's not even different from the Bush administration, which, you know, if you look at Africa, for instance, was an area where enormous attention was paid to development. And it's not even clear to me that the development budget is going up, especially in the Obama administration. Climate change was supposed to be one of these issues. It was supposed to be the, the, uh, the transnational issue of our time. It was supposed to rest, to some extent, precisely on the breakdown of, of nation-state dominance and the rise of NGOs. And it's also supposed to be, in the Obama administration's understanding, the area of common interest that transcends all other common interests. Uh, and... And yet, look what's happened. Um, now, partly in the United States, it's because of the economy. It's not exactly a great moment to be talking about further cuts to your economy in the interest of, uh, of reducing carbon emissions. But uh, it has been squeezed out uh, by other issues. And in the international uh, negotiation, what have we seen? We've seen powerful nation states resisting, by the way, including us, but, but certainly in the case of China and India, resisting uh, real uh, limits uh, on, their, on their carbon emissions, and why? Because they believe that it is a, that fundamentally, the Chinese believe that it's a Western plot to keep them, it's part of a Western plot to keep them down. The West industrialized, polluted the world, made themselves powerful, and now wants to say, okay, let's cut that out, thereby denying China its great potential and rise. Uh, and so what you see are the, is our nation states not acting as if this common interest transcends all others, but must exist in a hierarchy of other national interests, including economic growth and, and the incre and increase in international power. Um, I mean, so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, will we look back and say that Obama, you know, made climate change his number one foreign policy objective, or even number two, or even number three? Um, or will we just say that he kind of went back to where Clinton left off uh, uh, and doesn't have and won't have much to show for it. I have to say, if I had to bet, it would be it'll be the latter rather than the former. Maybe just a, maybe just two more. Yes, sir. I'm Christopher Bright. I work for uh, Representative Daryl Issa on Capitol Hill. Uh, how do you interpret um, the president's statement on American exceptionalism? I think there was an exchange during the campaign where he was asked about American exceptionalism, and he said something like, I believe in it to the extent that the French believe in French right. exceptionalism and so forth. 
Well, is that, dis- is that a discontinuity? To agree with it to the degree French believe in French exceptionalism is a lot. So that's, uh, you know. But is that a discontinuity yeah. in American foreign policy or a continuity? In- it, it would be a discontinuity if he had, in fact, followed through on that. But what I found most striking about the Oslo speech was precisely a restatement of American exceptionalism in the Truman, Kennedy, Reagan tradition. I mean, that speech was remarkable in this regard. Um, any American president since World War II could have given that speech. And the basic premise of that speech was war is a fact of life, therefore military power is essential, and there's no better military power than American military power. Uh, and that's what we got to do. And look what we've done with that American military power. We've saved the world and we've promoted democracy and stability and security, all of which I happen to believe are true, but you can't say that's not an exceptionalist uh, position. So... I think that, as, and this is one of the, that's, I mean, the Oslo speech is one of my, is a data point for how easy it is, even for a president promising radical change, to slip back into a very traditional way of thinking and, and acting uh, as the president of the United States. So maybe one more question? Uh, yes, sir. Um, Jonathan Baker with the U.S. Senate. Um, I have a question. You, you spoke of the traditional allies in Central and Eastern Europe and their reactions to some changes in the uh, foreign policy of this administration. I want to talk about one in particular, but then to look a little bit higher up at, at a general trend, perhaps. And it's Turkey, a real crucial ally of the U.S. And, and to look at, uh, to analyze some of its behavior. Whereas with the Eastern Europeans, the, the U.S. perhaps took a step away from them, um, with Turkey and some of the other maybe comparable Islamic um, nations, the U.S. took a step towards them with the Cairo speech and, uh, and similar gestures. How can you explain their behavior um, perhaps towards, um, towards Israel, towards um, other neighboring countries, and, and then some of those other nations that maybe should have been forthcoming uh, following that speech? Well, I, you know... Turkey is is its own. It's hard to talk about Turkey and anybody else because Turkey is its own special issue. And I'm 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 worried that uh, you know on the one hand I think what Turkey's going through right now is a very beneficial and positive uh, evolution that I that I wish we could see occurring uh, in, in, throughout uh, the Islamic world, which is a, you know moving from. Uh, you know the kind of Ataturk approach to uh, a more uh, you know to, to a more Islamic approach, but nevertheless, hopefully, finding that happy medium where sort of modernity and Islam and and democracy can all coexist. I mean, in a way, that's what we're all hoping for. Now, one can be concerned in Turkey that that's not where this is stopping, uh, but I would say, based on Turkish history and the sort of embedded traditions of Turkey, at least for the century, that that we, we can hope that that comes out in the right place and that that may be the most important development that there is with regard to Turkey. As a, as a strategic ally, I guess I, I'm, I think probably we're losing Turkey as a strategic ally. Um, I'm not optimistic, and maybe I'm too pessimistic, but I'm not optimistic that Turkey is going to be – Turkey is always a difficult partner, by the way, uh, for us. I'm not saying we weren't a difficult partner for them, but uh, it's not as if it was always very easy – uh, to deal with, but I think it's going to be increasingly there's going to be increasing distance uh, in terms of strategic perception uh, between us and Turkey. Some of this has to do with the decision of the EU. I mean, I really think that that was a tragic, tragic decision uh, that the EU has made uh, to exclude Turkey. And even though people say the door is open and eventually, and maybe in 20 years or 60 years or 100 years, the Turks don't believe it anymore. And I think you can trace a certain uh, approach in Turkey, you can trace it right from the moment it became clear that Europe was not interested. Um, uh, that, together with the fracas we had with Turkey over Iraq, it's been, it was a kind of double header. Um, and I don't know what we need to do uh, to get that back, other than to wait for Turkey to sort of go through uh, its evolution and see where it comes up. Um, with regard to the rest of the world and the, Chi- the rest of the Arab world and the Cairo speech, uh, what I find at least maybe I'm talking to the wrong people, uh, the key thing about the Cairo speech and, and some, a lot of reformers in the Arab world is they feel disappointed. Uh, they actually were expecting that Obama would come in and actually support reform in the Arab world. He did talk about democracy uh, in Cairo, 
Um, and yet what we've seen out of the administration so far, uh, this is sort of the, certainly one of the last real, real uh, hardcore uh, reserves of the not-Bush approach uh, to the point where we've even seen our ambassador in Egypt uh, cutting democracy support programs and praising Egypt for the openness of its f- press, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we have elections coming up. We have parliamentary elections this year, and we have uh, presidential elections, and I'm sure that Mubarak, if he doesn't want to run for himself, will want to anoint his son in the continuing pharaonic uh, you know, uh, dynasty. Um, and it's very important that that not happen, actually, and that we really do press Egypt. And I think a lot of people are looking to the Obama administration to do this. And this is going to be one interesting area to see how long they cling to, if Bush was said he was in favor of democracy in the Middle East, we're opposed to it, as opposed to saying, what do we really want to happen out there? Um, if, and this is obviously a big if, you had a transition in Iran and a democratic opening in Egypt, um, you know, Bush officials are going to shoot themselves because what they wanted to see happen is going to happen on Obama's watch. Um, I'm not saying it is going to happen, but that would be, quite, would be quite an irony. And I don't rule out the possibility that that could be where Obama goes. I think that's enough for now. Enough okay. For now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>